Hello everybody, I'm Bruce Giebink, also known as Bruce the Buckeye, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, book that I have here today. It's entitled Minnesota Bug Hunt, and uh, once we get started, you'll notice a lot of the amazing close-up images. I wish I could take credit for those. The credit just goes to Bill Johnson, who uh, provided all the images in the book. Now there's 28 different insects featured in this book. These occur across five different habitats. So we're gonna get started here with uh, the first habitat that's closest to all of us, our backyard. Now this one here actually looks a lot like a bee or a wasp, but it isn't. It is actually a beetle. It's called the locust borer beetle. A lot of insects like to pretend they're something they're not. So they're kind of tricky in that respect. Here we have a bumblebee, specifically a tricolor bumblebee. And what's unique about bumblebees is uh, they're able to operate under cooler conditions than a lot of other pollinators. Now why is that? Well, they uh, have a dense layer of hair here that provides insulation. So when the bee starts moving around, muscles are generating heat, and that heat is trapped inside the body, which makes these bumblebees almost warm-blooded, meaning they're able to operate under much cooler conditions than they normally would. So that's why you see bumblebees as one of the first pollinators in the spring, as well as one of the first pollinators active on any given day, especially a cool day, and if it's a cool, cloudy day throughout, it's one of the last pollinators that's operating late in the day, while all the other ones are basically paralyzed. Okay, now we're moving on to our next habitat, which is a grassland or prairie habitat. We have a couple of uh, insects here. Both of them are very well uh, camouflaged. We've got the uh, Carolina locust here and the uh, Broadleaf, broadwing katie lid here. Now here is probably one of the more magical insects that you'll find in our area. And it's called a firefly, but it's not really a firefly at all. It's actually a special kind of a beetle. And this beetle has a uh, light producing organ at the tip of its abdomen that uh, it uses to make light signals. I should also mention that uh, the, lar the larvae, which uh, are down here, also have light producing organs, but they're pretty much distributed through their body. So the whole larva or grub glows. And for that reason, they're called glowworms. This is a very interesting insect here. This actually looks like a bee, kind of a ferocious looking bee but it's actually called a robber fly. Why robber fly? Well, they are, in the past they got that name because they attack bees. So basically they're like robbers of beehives, robbing the honey producers of honey producing bees. And they're kind of like the jet fighters of the uh, insect world where they'll be sitting on a twig or some wire, scanning the sky for a potential victim. And then they'll go zooming out there, stab it with their sharp beak, right to the ground, and then that's what they'll feed on. This cute little bug here, which is also on the cover, is a red milkweed beetle. They're one of the few insects that you'll find on milkweed plants. Why so few insects on milkweed plants? Well, milkweed is toxic. So only those insects that have specially developed uh, digestive systems are able to feed on it. A few insects that you might find on milkweed are this little beetle, uh, as well as some tussock moths, tussock moth caterpillars, and then of course one of our most famous butterflies of all, monarch butterfly caterpillars. Okay, let's move on to our next habitat, which is the woodland habitat. Now here we have a beautiful moth. It's called a, uh, it's a wild silk moth. It's called a cecropia moth. 
And I'm excited to talk about this particular moth because this is one I raise and I use in my programs. I use the uh, adults from uh, spring all the way through the end of summer. And then later on in the summer, I use the big hot dog sized caterpillars. And the reason I can use this particular moth is because it's very sluggish and lethargic during the daytime, meaning um, it's not gonna take off and fly away. But I slow them down even more and prolong their lives by keeping them chilled in a cooler. And that allows me to use this moth for oh, four to six weeks, whereas otherwise I'd only be able to use it for about seven to 10 days. Here we have, if I can kind of hold these so that you can see them against the background better. I've got a male Cecropia here in this hand and a female Cecropia in this hand. Now, they look a lot alike. Their color patterns on their wings are exactly the same. But if you look at them close, you can see some key differences. One's the size of the antennae. The other one is the size of the abdomen. The male has the largest, really feathery antennae, whereas the female's antennae are much smaller. There's a reason for that. That's because the male uses those antennae to locate the females, okay? Now, if you look closely at the abdomen or the bodies, you can see that the female has a much larger abdomen, and that's primarily because she's loaded with eggs, up to about 200 eggs. And those eggs are laid on different uh, broadleaf leaves, primarily uh, wild cherry, black cherry, and a few other broadleaf plants in this area, okay? Now we're gonna give these guys a little bit of a rest, and since they do rest quietly in the daytime, we're gonna just set them on my shoulders like that, and then we'll move on to the next insect, which is a lot like a moth, but it's a butterfly, okay? This is a morning cloak butterfly, and what's unique about this butterfly is that it is the first butterfly that appears in the spring. And there's a good reason for that. It spends the winter as an adult, hiding in little nooks and crannies. So it gets a head start and it's the first one that shows up. These guys can be flying around in the woods uh, when there's still snow on the ground as early as March, okay? The other thing about this butterfly is that it's very long lived. They can live almost a full year. And then we've got these members of our aquatic habitats. Here we have a couple different dragonflies pictured here. Um, there's the green darner dragonfly, 12 spotted dragonfly. They're excellent flyers, sometimes some of the best flyers in the uh, insect world. And they're very good at detecting bugs that are flying around them with these huge eyes that cover nearly the entire head. And there's giant water bugs, water striders, water boatmen. And now we're going to talk about our last habitat, which is the oak tree habitat. Oak trees can uh, support uh, up to 300 different kinds of insects on them, from tiny little gall wasps all the way to big wild silk moths that have caterpillars almost the size of uh, hot dogs. Now this little beetle here is called an acorn weevil, and they all have a snout, but the key is that the moth parts are in the very end of the snout, and they use those to drill little holes, particularly the females, into acorns, seeds, stems, and so forth, where they lay the eggs, and then the baby uh, weevil will grow. Well, that's the last insect we're gonna talk about today. I hope you're inspired to uh, pay more, clo more close attention to the uh, insect world when you're out and about.